Now uh, we will start the second breakout panel, Africa and Japan, business development, business and development partnership, partnerships after TCAD 5. The panelists for this session are Mr. Masaru Arakira, a senior researcher at the Asian Disaster Reduction Center, Professor George Croda, who is a, an associate professor of geography and environmental studies at the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Mr. Satish Silvanathan, who's the director of Premium Nutrients Private Limited, and the moderator for the session, Dr. Satoru Nishikawa, the director general of audit at the Japan Water Ag Agency. So Nish Dr. Nishikawa, please. Yes, uh, welcome to our session this afternoon. And uh, I'll be expecting more, I'll say, participants. But uh, before waiting for everybody to come, let us just start. Well, uh, the topic given here is quite interesting. Uh, African Japan Business and Development Partnerships after TCAD 5. I'm sure all of you are aware that there was a big conference. It's uh, once every five years, uh, the, the, uh, focusing on African development. Uh, it was held in June and there were a lot of positive outputs, but it's at the very senior, I will say, or the ministerial level discussions. How to bring this down to the ground is the challenge, and how to make real business, how to make uh, good, I will say, products out of this discussion of the ministerial level to the ground and on the maps is what is needed. So today we have uh, three distinguished panels, all of them from totally different backgrounds, from different countries, and I'm privileged to introduce, first let me introduce Professor Kuroda, and then uh, Satish, and Arakita-san. And uh, to save time, I would pass on the mic to every one of them, to, for them to make their initial uh, self-introduction, uh, self and then uh, also a short presentation. So, Professor Kuroda, please. Good afternoon. As mentioned, my name is George Kuroda. I come from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. When we begin to talk of Africa, people think that is a small country. Africa is a very big continent with varied landscapes, varied cultures, and even differences in terms of education levels, different government uh, governance structures, etc. And that is something you need to put in the picture as we start. But we can see that Africa has been known to be fairly a poverty-stricken area, an area for little development, and that is changing very rapidly. The situation in terms of natural resources has changed dramatically. There's petroleum and, and natural gas. There is an, all kinds of minerals now which have been discovered and explored recently. And this offers tremendous opportunities for investment in Africa. Secondly, there is the growing population. They are very youthful and growing population, which can be used as a market, but also in terms of human resources, that is an opportunity to be explored. One may argue that the level of an urbanization has also increased at a percentage of about 7.6 annually. That means that by the year 2030, most of the African countries will be more urbanized than they are presently in Kenya, for example, the urbanization level will be 60% in the year 2030. And we see this across the board, and that needs to be taken on board. But besides that, we have also a growing middle class, middle class population, which has not been tapped in terms of consumer uh, products, which offers opportunity for uh, entrepreneurs to invest in Africa. And thus, opportunities are across the board. Differences may occur with specific countries, as I mentioned, but should not be ignored. Now, one has, has asked the question, how about the African leadership? 
leadership is varied, as I mentioned, but there is growing democratization across the board as well. We begin to see uh, uh, elections being done every five years or so. We may disagree on whether they are uh, uh, you know, genuine or they have been tampered with, but that is another question to deal with. There's the improved national policy environment in the continent. Several countries have had new policies, new legislation, and consequently, the business environment is improving considerably in terms of natural resources uh, uh, development there. The economic integration of the continent also offers an opportunity to see larger market areas than just specific countries. We begin to see the East African community, which covers five states of the East African region. We begin to see the South African development community, which covers about eight, six states in the Southern African region. There is ECOWAS in the West African region and there's COMESA, Central Africa and Southern Africa Development, uh, I mean, uh, marketing region, which offers tremendous opportunity when you begin to see the, the opportunities that are available there. But there is also a growing interest in terms of governance that most countries are devolving, decentralizing. This has been thought to be one mechanism to open up space both social and economic space. And the devolution process is very important in terms of knowing just how, at what level one would like to interact with. I emphasize two levels, the economic region, economic market regions, and then the devolution. I leave the state because that is at the moment where most countries like Japan are involved. They are involved at state level and consequently that can be dealt with. Now, dealing with certain misconceptions. One of the biggest misconceptions in the continent is that there is poor governance. Of course, there may be poor governance in most of the countries, but this is an area which as business interests would be a question of risk. How much risk is there? There is a misconception about the level of corruption, that corruption is high and consequently business does not thrive there. This is also an area which we can debate on. There is question of the level of education in the continent, and this is also an area which can be discussed. And finally, the high business cost. But we tend to believe that business should thrive where there is risk. Without risk, there is no need for business, and consequently, there is no reason why we should not begin thinking of Africa as an investment destination, especially for Japan, which may be looking for large markets. We have a growing market. There are opportunities. And it's up to you to now interrogate some of the misconceptions and come up with conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kuroda. Now let me ask Satish uh, to make his uh, self-introduction and some ideas. Thank you, Dr. Nishigawa. Um, first of all, I must say it's a, it's a real honor to sit on the panel with you, uh, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background on what on what we do, uh, the company I represent, Premium Nutrients, we are in the, e in the edible oils and fat space. What that means is um, we process palm oil. We buy crude palm oil, we process it into highly value added um, products that are then used in the ingredient sector. Um, we run an export model. So what that means is we manufacture product as well as technology in Malaysia, and we export to 50 countries or sort of 55 countries across the world. Uh, we do some business in Africa, so we are well versed with some of the challenges that, uh, that come with uh, doing business in the continent. So the strategic case for Africa, I believe, is quite clear. Um, speaking uh, with respect to my industry specifically, the oil consumption per capita per year in Africa is roughly 15 to 16 kilos per person. This is compared with a global average of about 26 kilos per person per year. 
Um, 15 kilos per person is about the same as India. However, the big difference between Africa and India is that in the last 30 years, the edible oil consumption per capita per, capita per year in India has increased 55%. In Africa, it hasn't budged. Um, and when you consider oil is one of the most income elastic products you will have. Um, the UN commission, uh, sorry, not the UN, the FAO commissioned a study in 1987 or something that predicted that the oil consumption per year would increase from, sorry, the oil consumption per year in the developing countries would increase from 8 kilos per person to 11 kilos per person between 1988 and 2008, so 20 years. In 1995, seven years after that study was commissioned, oil consumption per person per year in the developing world had risen to 10 and a half kilos. That meant that the 2020, sorry, the 2010 number was then increased from 10 to 15 kilos. So a 50% increase happened in the, in the space of seven years, and that shows you how income elastic this product is. So, so the case, so this consumption statistic plus the fact that Africa has a billion people makes the case for our business in Africa very, very clear. However, just because a strategy is clear, it doesn't mean that companies like ourselves are particularly good at executing it. There are challenges. And for me, what is the, the number one challenge? It is logistics. The supply chain in Africa is not very easy to deal with. Would it surprise you if I told you that out of the 50 top performing ports in the world, and this is in a study commissioned by the UN, there is only one port from Africa, and that port is Durban. That is a uh, South Africa is a country of 50 million people. The continent is a billion people. Durban, South Africa is not representative of the, of the continent as a, as a whole. I would say that the only really functioning containerized ports in Africa are Durban, Mombasa in Kenya, Dar in uh, Tanzania, and possibly Abidjan in uh, the Ivory Coast. These ports and the periphery countries account for about 300 million people, which is 30% of the overall, of the overall African population. Therefore, how do we as a business, how do we conduct an export model to Africa when we can only reach 30% of the population at maximum. Um, there are issues with regards to port fees. There are issues with regards to port logistics. Um, there are issues with regards to how do you get the stuff from the port, from the terminal inland. So these are all real challenges that we face in dealing with Africa. And these are all real challenges that, that we're going to have to think about and deal with if we want to truly tap the potential of, of, of the uh, continent. When people talk about investing, and, and certainly when people talk about investing in my industry, there's a lot of focus put on how many factories can we build, how much capacity can we have, you know, can we increase from 1,000 tons a day to 2,000 tons a day. All of this is valid, however, there needs to be more than that. There, there needs to be investment in supply chain. There needs to be investment in port services. Uh, there needs to be investment in human capital that can, op that can operate these things. When we own assets and when we manage assets, it's as important of how we do it as opposed to what we do. And I feel that these are questions which we all need to think about. Thank you. Then uh, let me turn to Arakida-san. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nishikawa. Uh, I'm uh, Masara Arakida, uh, senior researcher of Asian Disaster Reduction Center. Uh, I have uh, experience not, uh, not only in Japan and uh, many Asian countries, uh, Central American countries, Caribbean countries, and Kenya. Uh, I, I've been in Kenya from 2011. Uh, please uh, look at that uh, slide. Uh, it's a uh, flooding in Kenya. It's a very common uh, picture in Kenya. Not a special, very common. Uh, and uh, is people crossing river? No, it's a road. But uh, every rainy season, they have to uh, cross uh, with, uh, on the water. 
and uh, using boat. It's a problem uh, because uh, during a rainy season, they couldn't bring uh, products by the vehicle. It's a problem for development. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I have many experience for uh, uh, community-based uh, disaster management activity. Uh, during the, our project, many residents and the local government people uh, participate very actively. Uh, but uh, uh, usually, when it finished, the activity decreased. Why? Uh, they cannot keep the motivation uh, because of lack of budget or some problem of materials, tools. And uh, I discussed for this matter uh, with Kenyan Red Cross Society. They introduced uh, some idea uh, for uh, uh, sustainable development. Uh, <coughs> the idea is involving communities from the beginning, not show the uh, final plan, but discuss uh, from the beginning. The second is uh, creating ownership and uh, promoting affordable low maintenance technology and uh, building institu uh, institutional capacity, not for personal, but uh, institutional uh, capacity development, and uh, using local resources. Uh, that's a uh, KLCS uh, uh, key point. And uh, I add uh, one more idea uh, for a sustainable acti uh, activity. Uh, this is a... Uh, Okay, for profitable approach. Uh, uh, for me, I'm a disaster management specialist. Uh, I live uh, how to survive or how, how to uh, keep safe my family. But uh, most of people uh, cannot live for disaster management but uh, they can work for getting more money or uh, getting uh, more safer uh, or more better life. So uh, this idea for getting more money is a good, I, I think it's a good approach for them. Okay, next slide, five. Uh, why they need uh, money for better life? A cycle of disaster makes community uh, poverty because of accumulation of damage. But if community uh, prepares uh, before disaster, uh, can, community can grow up. So, next please. So, uh, I show you uh, three ideas in Kenya. But uh, I'm sorry, it, it's not a, a success story because in the, on, the, on the way uh, to conduct. The first idea uh, to raise the, the foundation and use the uh, hall as a, a fish pond. In this area, uh, maximum uh, flooding level is uh, 80 centi. So if the raised uh, one meter, it's enough for them. And, uh, uh, around the Victoria Lake, uh, Lake Victoria, uh, people uh, love to eat fish. So, uh, fish pond is a, a good way to get more money. Okay, next, please. Uh, next challenge is uh, make charcoal, not from wood, but from maize cob. Uh, corn is a, a principal food in Kenya people. Uh, so, uh, there are so many maize cobs around their houses. If you, uh, they uh, use a maize cob to make charcoal, it means uh, the keep environment the, around their houses and keep a uh, protect uh, forest to keep water. Uh, it's a challenge of uh, JOCV, uh, Japan, uh, Japan Overseas, uh, corporation volunteers. 
So uh, we'd like to use this idea to our project site. Next, please. The third is a, a ecological sanitation toilet. It's not a new idea, new activity in the world. There are so many uh, examples, uh, even in uh, Sri Lanka, India, uh, Central American countries, and uh, African countries. Uh, it's a, a very nice approach to reduce uh, health risk related uh, uh, flooding. Uh, the contamination after flooding is a very big problem uh, for their health uh, conditions. But the more good point is to reuse the worst uh, for the sanitizer. But the problem is a uh, uh, rejection from a local resident. They don't want to use uh, use uh, human manure for their food product. It's a big challenge, but uh, uh, it will uh, be uh, helpful for their life uh, better. Thank you, uh, you Arakida-san. Well, uh, I think we have had three different types of topics. Uh, three different expertise, and let me add a little bit more. And uh, so please show my slide. And my name is Satoru Nishikawa. Uh, right now I'm with the Japan Water Agency. Well, what my organization does is to provide water, stable water supply for tap water, agricultural water, industrial water, and some of our uh, facilities are used for hydroelectricity, and also we try to provide water for the environment. So uh, my duty right now is how to manage water resources in a good governance. But however, uh, today I'd like to focus on uh, the basic human needs and how the Japanese experience can be shared with some of the issues that Africa faces. So the next slide, please. Now, please take a look at this map. Uh, this is a, the world map showing the differences in the infant mortality rate. And as you can see, of course, from country to country, there are differences. And you would see that, well, uh, many of the countries in Africa still face challenges. Now the next slide, please. Now, this is some of the figures that are taken from the World Health Statistics in 2013. And uh, I guess not many of you know, but uh, Japan is the lowest in the infant mortality rate. It's much lower than even the United States or the United Kingdom. But as you can see, for example, in Sierra Leone, it's uh, a big problem. And I'm sure that any mother would not want to see her baby die. It's common to the world. Okay, next slide. But Japan was not so fortunate 100 years ago. This is a graph showing the change of the infant mortality rate in Japan uh, from year 1900. As you can see, uh, the infant mortality rate in Japan was well over 100. If we, it was 100, it, was the, it would be the worst in the world right now. But we, as you can see from the graph, we have made big progress, starting especially from the 1920s. And we have the experience and we have the, I'll say, the institutional knowledge of how to deal with this infant mortality rate. And infant mortality is not just the baby issue. It represents the overall health and sanitation condition of the community. Okay, the next slide. Of course, uh, medical doctors would have played a big role, but it's not just that. In starting from the 1900s in Japan, especially in the village areas, there has been a lot of efforts put into 
improving the local living conditions. It was called the Seikatsu Kaizen movement in Japan. And uh, it has been conducted, or I'll say, starting from the 1900s. And of course, uh, there were various types, but they were categorized into three categories. Kaizen, which requires money, that's one pattern. The second is Kaizen, which does not require money. The third is Kaizen, which produces money. And I would like to just focus on the third uh, category, which can be uh, a suggestion for Japan to share the, our experience regarding uh, health and sanitation to many of the uh, African countries. Uh, especially this, the third Kaizen was enforced for villages by Ministry of Agriculture in Japan since 1948 as kind of a women in development approach. And this is one example is the so-called chicken to kitchen project. Well, in many of the village farms or the village uh, households, uh, the wives were encouraged to keep chickens in the backyard. And the chickens would produce eggs and the wives would sell it to the market. And that would produce small cash for the housewives. And what uh, the, the local government policy encouraged is that save the cash for a while and encourage the wives to use that cash to renovate their kitchens. And that greatly decreased the labor of the women and also greatly improved the sanitation of the households. And that's only uh, one example, but this type of how to combine local small business with cash creation and then to lead to uh, investment for good use, that produced a kind of a positive cycle. And these types of approaches can be applied uh, to many other countries who need improvement in health and sanitation. So I'll stop here. And uh, well, as you can see, we have four different types of expertise. And well, uh, the audience is not big, so it means that you have many chances to throw your ideas and please. And uh, we discussed beforehand that the four of us would not be the main speakers. We want to invite you and to speak up and let's have interactive discussion. So thank you. And if you have, uh, if the three of you have any additional comments, please make it now or we can open the floor. Which would you like? Okay. So the floor is open. So uh, you are most welcome to make any uh, interventions and questions or uh, have your ideas uh, spoken. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, my name is Yamanaka. I'm teaching entrepreneurship here at Globus University. Uh, my question is about entrepreneurship. How uh, popular is the entrepreneurship in African countries? Specifically, I'm interested in uh, uh, younger entrepreneurs in uh, African countries are interested in starting their business in which sector in Africa? Infrastructure, or IT, healthcare, what is the typical uh, pattern of entrepreneurship in Africa? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the, the typical characteristic of the African population is a youthful population. I also mentioned the, the increasing number of uh, middle class in Africa, and it is between the age of 25 to about 40. That is the age which is 
getting involved in business and also in entrepreneurship. Now, different countries have had different uh, policies towards getting young people to business. I would mention only a few. For example, in South Africa, after independence, they came up with affirmative action in which most of the government contracts went to 30% of the government contracts went to youth and women organization. That was affirmative action to bring up the, 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 the capacity of women and young people to get involved in business. In, in Kenya, for example, it's slightly different that Kenya has, has established a fund approximately uh, <coughs> a $3.2 million fund to support youth and women in establishing business. That has not been rolled out, but it is already a government policy which appeared and is budgeted for it. So we expect that the young people will get into business along those lines. In other countries, there are different policies towards youth and women, and this is not a very small thing because more than 60% of the population are youth and women. The older population is much smaller as compared to Japan, for example. So we have a very youthful population and women for a long time were excluded in the, in the business. And consequently, there is a whole reserve of human capital in, in women which is now being exploited. And I see vast opportunities in those areas, getting uh, in those businesses. But let me get to specific issues of which entrepreneurship. Now, the IT is the most popular one at the moment because I think it is easy to establish. It doesn't require much upstream capital and therefore very easy to get into. But we also seeing young people getting into manufacturing Processing especially, so processing factories require very little, except especially when we could get oil from our colleagues here. Then they would establish small factories which have expanded even beyond community level. They initially started as small uh, manufacturing plants, sometimes at the backyard of, of somebody's house, but these are expanding tremendously. And so small, small and medium businesses in especially Kenya is growing faster than any sector of the economy because of self-employment, the massive amount of labor available, as well as the, the urbanization uh, and, and education I mentioned earlier. Now, IT processing is very popular, especially uh, uh, food processing, agricultural processing, and other uh, uh, beauty products. We also beginning to see a lot of invest investment going in art. The film industry, for example. Film and theater is completely unexplored. Most of the television stations are using uh, other, other, uh, you know, other programs from elsewhere. And we are beginning to see a lot more young people get involved in film industry, theater, film, and that is growing very, very fast. The government in Kenya came up with a, a regulation that more than 40% of the shows must be locally made. And so we are beginning to see massive employment expansion in that area as well. But that is just to mention a few. Uh, young people are creative, they, they, they have more energy, and, and uh, are ready to try risks, and consequently are beginning to be much open. Now, the next question would be, how would Japanese participate in this? And that is a very good question, because I would like to see a situation in which the young Japanese organize themselves and explore opportunities some of which I have mentioned, where they can get in touch with young, young people in various countries because they are organized. Most of the governments have youth and women ministries in government, and therefore that is an entry point. Uh, most of the 
uh, civil societies are organized around youth and women, and that also op opens opportunities as entry points. So the, the critical question is what level of participation would the young Japanese want to collaborate with the, the African young people? I hope uh, that explains a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, please. Uh, my name is Christian Vlad. I'm a researcher here at Globus, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Japan Creative Enterprise, a small um, creativity art-related uh, com company based here in Tokyo. I was very surprised and pleased to hear Mr. Kuroda's uh, comments about art and the youth of Japan. I must confess that I've seen an increasing number of students coming from African countries to Japan over the past years. And I'm wondering, actually, and I would very much like to uh, know your point of view on what Japan and African states can do to further promote um, exchanges, cultural and educational exchanges between Japan and African countries, also in line with creativity and art. Thank you very much. Would you like to respond, please? Thank you very much. Uh, and that is a very popular area, as I mentioned. Of course, I'm not a youth anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm past my, my sixth decade, so, so I don't qualify to be a youth. But I've been involved in the public sector quite a bit. I was permanent secretary in the Ministry of Water and Environment. I was also permanent secretary in, uh, in, uh, in uh, ministry in charge of irrigation. But I generally know the issue of public policy that, as I mentioned, there is increasing opening in policy environment amongst the African states. I won't go specifically into to how to, but I would probably see a situation in which the Japanese cultural uh, uh, center uh, begins to uh, contact some of the Japanese embassies and cultural centers in various African states, African governments, and see how they can collaborate. I think that will be an entry point through the, the, your offices in the states in the African states. But I also see a situation in which the artists from Japan could organize themselves to, to display cultural activities in, in some of the fairs organized in the African continent. There are various fairs which are organized annually, and some of these fairs offer opportunity to showcase what is available in in, in, in here. We, we generally know that Japanese are very good, uh, you know, what is it called? Acrobatic? Uh, acrobatics and, 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 uh, and those kinds of arts. And those are beginning to find place with the young people where they want to display uh, acrobatics in the, in the, in the, in the theaters and, and I presume that will offer opportunity. So a Japanese cultural troupe visiting the continent could visit two or three countries and see, display what they have, and then see how to explore opportunities that are available. But in terms of educational fairs, this is also available, that uh, educational fairs could be organized by, by uh, Japan and visit several countries and display the educational features of interest to Japanese young people and even older people that would be also organized through the embassies, but also from here. Now, one would begin to ask, what is the demand like? Demand is, as I mentioned, young people want to try things. They only need to find out sometimes what is it that they are good at? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kuroda. So, uh, Satish, would you like to add something with, based on your experience uh, working in Asia and Africa? 
I agree with everything Professor Korda has said. Um, but in terms of my own experience, um, I was recently at the World Economic Forum Africa Summit in uh, Cape Town. And I heard a statistic which actually shocked me. Um, by 2020, 50% of the African population will be under the age of 25. Is that, is that right? That's 500 million people under the age of 25, which is, you know, it's staggering, right? Um, and in, edit, in addition to this, the other thing that surprised me was the World Economic Forum has a group of people called Young Global Shapers, and these are people under 30 uh, years of age. And a lot of them were African. And a lot of them were in technology, exactly like what uh, Professor Kroda said, in technology, IT, uh, the creative arts, uh, media, movies, um, bloggers, makeup artists, cosmetics people. Uh, really, it was, it, it was amazing to see that amount of young, or that amount of smart young people participating in these uh, cool industries, you know, sort of away from the manufacturing and processing and, you know, uh, traditionally more, quote unquote, boring businesses. Um, and I felt really good about that because I felt that this was, this is the right thing for the continent and this is the right thing for young people to get uh, interested in. And Professor Crota also made another very interesting point about women. And one thing which I took away from that summit was um, somebody said 20 years ago when one thought of an Ethiopian woman, you would think of a woman walking down the street with uh, pots on her head, uh, with water or food or, or something. And in 2000 and what uh, year are we in? 2013, <laughs> When one thinks of an Ethiopian woman, it is, a, it is an Ethiopian woman walking down the street with pots of water on her head on a cell phone. Um, and that, to me, summed it up really well. Um, the, advent of the advent of technology, the, the penetration of uh, technology, that is going to change people's lives. I also had the, the good fortune to visit the... Um, Commodities exchange in, in uh, Ethiopia. And the work which they are doing with the farmers, with the coffee farmers, for example, is unbelievable. Every day there is an SMS alert that gets published by the commodities exchange, and the coffee farmers in the villages will get the price of coffee on their phone, and then they can decide whether or not to then take their coffee to a dealer to sell it. So in the past, they would have to make that trip every single day with the coffee and then decide. Now, the coffee farmers have the option whether they can stay at home and wait another day for the price to increase or they take it to the dealer that day. And the advent of technology really, really is going to make a, you know, a, a huge impact. Uh, let me just mention something which uh, 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 one may want to consider, especially uh, uh, business people. And this is the issue of outsourcing, business outsourcing. This is becoming fairly popular, where the young people use technology once again to outsource business. Uh, this is mainly in, uh, in, uh, in uh, services such as, uh, you know, uh, PR, public relations, uh, uh, services such as um, uh, cleaning services and that kind of business arrangement. But the, the, the most common one is basically buying and selling through the internet. And that is beginning to be fairly popular. As technology improves, a lot of people are being exposed and consequently a lot of business has started going on uh, through the internet, etc. And this is also offers an opportunity to expand even the Japanese market to where you cannot reach through uh, business outsourcing. Thank you. Actually, I'm just going to jump in on that point on technology. Um, Standard Chartered Bank in Africa have said that mobile banking is one of their biggest growth areas. And again, that stuns me because I would have thought that mobile... Uh, Leave, leave aside mobile banking. Mobile phone penetration in Africa is probably hard enough, but clearly it's come up to such a level that mobile banking is the number one growth area of, uh, of their uh, product. 
Thank you for the question, please. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, actually, I have a question, especially for Mr. Salvanathan, uh, about the supply chain management in Africa. You mentioned about the current supply chain uh, management uh, system would sustain or to reach only 30 million people in Africa. And I used to work in, in creating a cold chain uh, in Africa as well. So I, I know the, the difficulty and to, to cover the huge continent in Africa. Um, I think that there's like two hurdles. Uh, one is to create the infrastructure, first point. And the second point is to make it uh, a sustainable system. And I think the second part is more more difficult part. And I would like to hear your opinion on, on, on how to make that happen. If I knew, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, look, your point is absolutely right. Um, we've also tried figuring out the right cold chain. We manufacture a margarine product that needs to be in a cold chain, and it's hard. Um, and your points are perfectly valid. You can create a system to get from point A to B, and you can do it once, you can do it twice, you can do it three times, but making a sustainable model is really challenging. And I feel that whoever cracks that first, and it, look, it's far from being cracked, right? There's, there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done. Whoever cracks that first will, will do very well. Um, one of the big challenges is just the lack of infrastructure in general. You need, you need a very basic level in, of infrastructure to make all of this possible. You know, that, that needs to be the foundation, that needs to be the backbone of any supply chain. If you're only going to be able to reach 30% of the population through the sea, well, uh, what I mentioned in terms of uh, port logistics, you're going to have to get to 70% of people via land. A lot of the roads in Africa aren't great. Um, and in fact, I can tie this back to my own home country, actually my home country being uh, Sri Lanka. We had a civil war for 30 years, and for ma the majority of my lifetime, um, I would argue that 20 to 30 percent of my country was inaccessible. So the north and the east, which was the principal area where the Civil War was being fought was, it was impossible to get to. When the Civil War ended in the year 2008, it was almost like we had a new market within our own country. Roads sprang up, railroads sprang up. Uh, we could get to these places far more easily and far more effectively than we've, able, than we've ever been able to get to in the past. We run the largest uh, brewery in uh, Sri Lanka. And in 2008, literally, we had a new market come up within the country. And that network of roads, that network of railways, changed the game completely. Now, I know that a lot of governments in West Africa, particularly, are looking to set up these network of roads. And I feel once that gets done, the productivity of a country will go through the roof. You know, it's, it's, it's much more than somebody setting up a toll road from point A to point B, 300 kilometers way. It is the mobility of talent. It is the mobility of services. It is the mobility of goods. And once this happens, we're going to, I really believe the productivity of the continent is going to be, going to be uh, something else. I don't know how to crack the cold chain, but we need to keep putting one step in front of the other and get there somehow. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's very true that infrastructure has been quite uh, uh, a hindrance to, to expansion of trade in Africa. Let me mention a few progressive reports. Japan especially has funded a rail, I mean infrastructure between Zambia, uh, 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 Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. A massive highway is opening in that region. And also another highway from Zambia to, to, to Mozambique. These are areas which were not covered in the past. And we're beginning to see massive movement of both capital as well as hu both human and, and in other forms of capital between the states. Kenya, for example, has, has, been expand has now started expanding another port in Lamu. 
besides improvement of Port of Mombasa, which has seen major improvements in the last uh, four or five years. Dar es Salaam has also improved its port facilities considerably, but also Dar es Salaam is connected with Malawi and Zambia, uh, and that railroad was built by the Chinese. Now it is being upgraded and will open the entire region from the coast west, I mean the, 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 the Indian Ocean inland to the border with Namibia. Considerable opening is beginning to, op to, to occur in, in that region. Now, when Kenya builds the Lamu port just next to Somalia, then that is supposed to cover uh, northern Kenya, South Sudan, into, 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 um, into Mali. That will connect West Africa and the East African coast. And that is tremendous opportunity, which is already planned and may be, may, may be operating in the next five or six years. So it's true that Africa was impenetrable before. It, uh, uh, when I started working, when we, we went to fly to North Africa, we flew to Europe and came back to Africa. But that has changed considerably. I think uh, let's not live in the past. The, the change is fairly rapid. It is swift. And as I said, business people must begin to see, to take risk and be a part of the change rather than wait for the change to occur. By the time the change occurs, it will be very, very difficult for anybody to penetrate those areas. So I suggest business people must be abreast with the change, ensure that the change is occurring, and tap in those areas of change as soon as they are able to. Thank you. I'd like to invite more questions. Thank you for your response. Uh, let me just add one po more point. But uh, um, it, the infrastructure, it is uh, really important to create at the first place. Um, but again, uh, when I went to Angola, uh, there was a road created by Japanese uh, self-defense force uh, through the PKO. And it was uh, you know, not functioning after three years because no one really maintained it. And uh, it's, it's easy to create at the first place, but um, again, the question is how to maintain it. And it really depends on the people uh, to maintain that. And it, it's really hard to, it probably goes down to education, but it takes a really long time. So it, it's kind of hard for business to go into Africa without those you know, infrastructure, including the people. So that would be, uh, it's not going to open ended question. There will be no right answer, but uh, just my uh, additional comment to that. Thank you. Uh, look, I think you're right. However, you have to ask why the road wasn't maintained. Now, is there, was there a misalignment of incentives? Uh, whoever built that road, whichever concessionary built that road, should have been benefiting from tolls from that road. Why that didn't happen, I don't know. Now, again, I know a lot of West African governments are doing it on a PPP, uh, private-public partnership basis, whereby they invite people to come and build roads. And then whoever builds the road gets a 30-year concession. And that's the way that road is paid back. And that's what gives the concessionary an incentive to maintain that road. Because if the road's not maintained, then they're not going to get any uh, money from it. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear that. Um, but I truly believe more than just what you're saying about people, it's how do you incentivize people to do the right thing to keep these things uh, sustainable. Let me add, uh, I guess, well, the road was uh, made, constructed by the PK operations. But if there had been, well, let's say, a local businessman or local farmer who wanted to use that road to export their products from their villages to somewhere else, they would have had incentives to maintain that road. Exactly. So now, uh, what I would like to s uh, really uh, toss the idea is that, of course, there has been so many, I would say, aid to Africa. But we should not keep it as an aid. It sh 
has to be combined with local incentives. And if it's combined well with the local incentives, it would be really maintained. And it would be adapted to the for the interest of the local community. And that's what we need, especially not only in Africa, in many countries. And as, as I showed you the slide about the chicken and to the kitchen, it's an, it was an incentive created by the Ministry of Agriculture at the first place, but it brought cash to the wives. So it's a big incentive for the wives. So then it made business. Now, I guess many of the uh, challenges that uh, we face in many countries is how to combine the initial uh, infrastructure investment into a local incentive or local interest. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, sorry, but uh, not for my project. Uh, I, I'd like to introduce uh, the other ideas. Uh, many Japanese uh, well know uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, it's a big name, and also Lake Victoria. And uh, uh, safari, uh, Maasai. But uh, do you know, uh, what do you know as other uh, from Kenya? Mount Kenya. Mount Kenya, ah, okay. Uh, Mount Kenya is a second level uh, in Africa continent, yeah. But uh, many Japanese uh, less know about Africa, Kenya. But uh, we well know about the uh, kohi beans from Mount Kilimanjaro. If uh, ja uh, Japan, uh, Japanese go to uh, around Kilimanjaro and make uh, some new products and name uh, from Mount Kilimanjaro, maybe many Japanese uh, will interest in that product. So uh, I support to use the big name of uh, Africa for new products. Uh, if, uh, in, in my case, if I try to use a uh, soil uh, in a river bank from Mount Kilimanjaro and make some brick or uh, some uh, dish or uh, and may, uh, na names uh, from Mount Kilimanjaro, it will be uh, <coughs> better uh, product. And also, it's a new way uh, to kaizen the uh, river situation. It's a combination for uh, disaster management and uh, getting new money. Yeah. Uh, further questions, ideas? Yes, please. The late. Yes, please. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Ken Shibusawa, uh, president of the Japan Center for International Exchange. I'm also a, a member of the Keizai Doyukai, which is the Federation of Corporate Executives, and um, in that I'm the uh, vice chairman for the TCAD uh, follow-up uh, project team. Um, and in, in that sort of uh, uh, sphere of corporate executives, it seems like lots of the uh, um, um, thoughts about a, uh, Africa is, is centered around the, actually the hard infrastructure that's been sort of been talked about. Um, and that's obviously very, very important. Um, but if you think about it, uh, the greatest sort of natural resource for the African continent is the African people. And, and that's why I think there's some talk about education, one, and, and two is the health system. Um, and that's my question is about the health system. Um, for the first time, the Japanese government has included uh, global health as a foreign policy uh, initiative. Um, that includes um, uh, disciplines such as university health coverage, uh, Japan's also a big contributor to the Global Fund, which is a, you know, the AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria, which are the three diseases that really impacts the, uh, the, the working uh, demographics of, of, of a developing country. Um, um, so, you know, Japan, also in the area of global health, has some ideas about how to, you know, uh, aid and in invest in Africa in terms of global health, but I was wondering from the African sort of perspective, um, what what can Japan bring to the continent in this area of, of health, you know, improving your health system?
です。Well,、uh, in my initial presentation, I showed you、uh, the audience about the, the Japanese experience of Seikatsu Kaizen Undo. It started in the 1900s, and would you please show the, the graph? And it really contributed to sharply decreasing the infant mortality rate. And as you know, the Japanese government has been raising the The, I would say it's a broad idea of human security. And this human security includes health and sanitation, and also disaster reduction, and other basic educational needs. And I think how to combine the idea of the human security with local businesses would be a one solution to really、uh, combine the Japanese experience of. Improving that terrible infant mortality rate into the best in the world. And that kind of、uh, the expertise and our experience can be shared positively with many of the African countries. Thank you. Thank you very much.、Uh, it is true that、uh, the continent still has uh, basic uh, uh, needs issues. And that is health,、uh, food security,、uh, such as issues such as malnutrition, is especially in the West Africa Sahelian belt, uh, uh, issues of, of、uh, impact of disasters, as mentioned by, by Masaru a little earlier in regards to floods.、Uh, you are looking at communities which sometimes. Have very little capacity to absorb any kind of disaster.、Uh, you know, communities in Japan even understand the typhoon was passing here. If it was in the African continent, we'll be talking of some a different type of story.、Uh, you know, it will be not a casual event. But that is true. That the vulnerability is quite high at the moment in terms of areas of basic needs health, education, and, and, and,、uh, and food security. In the past, the Japan, Japanese government has supported water and sanitation programs in most of the African countries, and we thank them for that.、Uh, quite a lot of support, especially in Kenya. When I was、uh, Uh, in charge of、uh, water and irrigation, Japanese, we received tremendous support from the Japanese government, not just in, in water services alone, water supply, but also in irrigation. That's an opportunity to deal with health issues, basic needs, water, clean water supply, as well as food security. There are other instances such as these, such interventions which will change the, 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 the vulnerability of the people. And especially if that support goes to rural areas. There is quite, when you get to the African continent, you, 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 I, I mentioned this, not just the variety of countries and their level, levels of development. But even within one country, you may think you are in two countries because of the, the income gap. The, the, the gap between the poor and the, and the rich is very marked and considerable. And therefore, support to rural areas g o a long way in dealing with vulnerability. And that is one entry point where the, the business people could support. Such cases of, of rural water supply, rural sanitation.、Uh, Masaru also mentioned just simple technology dealing with the floods, raising the, the latrine levels, and, and dealing with flood issues, which would cause an epidemic in the entire village because the flood is annual and, and the terrain does not absorb much water, and they have pit latrines, and therefore, when the flood comes, the latrine. Interacts with surface water and they use surface water for、uh, sanitation. Consequently, those are entry points in which 
massive change can occur in basic needs. In, in, in West Africa, also our company does some work in Niger, Niger and, 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 uh, and uh, Central African Republic, where there is massive, massive malnutrition. In fact, the continent, that Sahelia belt, probably you are aware, is known for serious malnutrition and it is chronic. There, may, there must be certain interventions which will work in those areas, but they need to be specific and they must, need to be tailor-made to certain countries. We cannot talk about the continent having malnutrition while uh, when you come to Nairobi, you may, be, you may think you are in London. There's no difference. There's enough food, everybody is. There's enough cars, enough traffic jams, you know. But when you go to the rural area, then you begin to see the magnitude of need in those areas. So it is a point in which one may want to really discriminate on where you put your support. Now, I know in TICAD 5, the Japanese government emphasized more of partnerships rather than aid, and that is the direction to go. In spite of the rural population being poor, they do not need relief. They need some arrangement in which they participate in the act. And consequently, the issue of sustainability will not arise because they will own the process themselves. And that is what I mentioned about devolution, the decentralization process. One needs to understand the underlying governance structures in order to make any intervention sustainable. So there are several opportunities of support, uh, thanks to Global Fund. Now malaria is probably handled in Kenya very well, but not in all countries have seen such major shifts. Uh, in Kenya, we introduced also the free education, primary school education, which has made tremendous impact with, within a period of one year, the primary school uh, children going, go, uh, primary, going, primary school going children, the numbers increased by more than 60%. And that was quite something. Now, if that continues, then you will see in another 15, 20 years, people coming from college with a different mentality, different uh, consumption patterns, and different uh, uh, ways of living. And consequently, it will not take 50 years like it took. <laughs> Sorry to mention that. Things are moving very fast. It's a question of an intervention. And two, three years, you begin to see results. And that is where I think the African continent is. Results will come very quickly, so long as they are appropriately and tailored, well targeted towards a given bracket of people, and not necessarily uh, aid as we used to have in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, I was a student here uh, in Grovis, and I used to be in Kenya as a volunteer for 2002-2002. From the viewpoint of that, I think that uh, the viewpoint of reinvestment in the local uh, area is required, especially in the Africa, I think. I was a, a teacher in the secondary school in Kenya, uh, in eastern province of Tutuda uh, secondary school. And uh, I was teaching, but I was very disappointed because most of the students couldn't get any job after the graduation, although they had a good uh, grade uh, in the KCSE. So, uh, and I saw the success in the M-Pesa in Kenya, that is the money transfer system, which is brought by the Vodafone. And uh, the local people were uh, now uh, very easy to tr transfer the money, and it was increased the uh, mobility of the business now. And in that case, uh, the local business, as you said, the middle sector people are doing the business and uh, encouraging their business so much and they are paying the taxes. For example, in the case of Mbesa, you increase the tax rate on the transferring on the money, but that money was not invested in the local area. 
for example, in the Kenya or in the any uh, Nigeria or etc. So that even though the in the in the beginning, there if there was the infrastructure, it was deteriorated and not to be maintained. So that such circulation, including the business, business tax and reinvestment to the local life, uh, local life and the government and the infrastructure, I think that system is required for, for the further development, I think. So that in uh, that balance of the population growth and the growth in the economics and the growth of the GDP and et cetera would be balanced, I think. Thank you. Uh, further questions? Uh, I was notified that we only have five more minutes so this is the last one. Yes, please. Of course. Welcome. Thank you. Um, the title of this panel is uh, Partnerships After TCAD. And I was wondering if, uh, I, was, if I wanted to, uh, uh, if my business wanted to invest in Africa. And the, uh, the infrastructure may not be there, but I wanted to invest in the people there. Um, are there opportunities to create partnerships with local uh, local businesses, local organizations, local schools, in order to train um, the local Africans in the port, for example, in order to help sell my products or something. Is that happening right now? Is Japan encouraging that? Um, what, what are the obstacles to that? And is that a viable solution going forward? Okay. Uh, Professor Kroda, do you have any ideas? Uh, uh, this was supposed to be uh, an open discussion. I don't have solutions at all, but, uh, but I can see that there are solutions amongst us here. Some very good ideas are beginning to emerge just from the participants. It is true that uh, the development of most African countries have gone through circles since uh, post-independence, and now we are beginning to see relative stability. And that is why I'm very positive about the continent now, that there is relative stability in spite of pockets of, of uh, political uh, challenges like Egypt, like, like Somalia, like Central Africa, like uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Those are pockets, and there will be pockets. I don't think that will be eliminated. But the positive thing is, as emerging from the floor, is the technology. Use of technology is causing Africa to change very rapidly, especially in the business area. There may have been poor integration of how benefits accruing from this technological progress can be distributed to the general population. That may have been one difficulty. Where benefits, companies begin making profits, Barclays Bank, the Standard Bank, and all these big banks make more profit in Africa than they do here in, in Japan. So you, you, you begin to see that there may have been some serious disconnect between the profitability of international corporations and the African population. That I mentioned is changing because of devolution and decentralization process. So we will begin to see that change over the continent. In terms of training, most of the African trained personnel are mainly from countries which were their colonial masters before. You will find a lot of West Africans training in France and speaking French. A lot of Eastern, Southern Africans who are British oriented training in Britain and therefore English is uh, the language there. So you will see differences. But opportunity does not stop there. We, we have some support coming from from Japan in terms of building of universities, expansion of university curriculum, as well as supporting curricular development in schools. 
So there are areas in which training and capacity building uh, where Japan has been involved in. It's just a question of expanding this and making it more useful and more relevant to the population. I see that time is up. <laughs> well, uh, I see the time is up. And uh, I really would like our three distinguished panelists for their very uh, lively inputs. And also, I would like to uh, thank uh, the floor for having so many active interventions and uh, uh, questions. And I think we were able to share uh, various thoughts about uh, the future of uh, Japan and Africa. Uh, thank you, and I'll pass the mic. Thank you very much, Mr. Kawa. Let's give a great round of applause for our panelists.